二号。Speaker, speaker, speakers. Okay. Zoom, 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 zoom meetings. There we go. This is the sixth. Yep. I need to send it all. There we go. Close that. I have that here. <laughs> Brian? Yes, sir. How you doing? Doing well. How are you? I'm doing fine. Um, I got an email from somebody this afternoon. I don't remember if it was you. I didn't have a chance to get to it. It's been a busy day. Wasn't me. Okay. You got you a new haircut. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Looks good. Thank you, sir. Hey, Shannon, how you doing? Shannon? I don't think he's got the sound on. You referring to me? I just got it. Ah, there you go. One of you guys emailed me. Shannon, was it you question asking me about your quiz or? Mm, no. Okay. Not, not this week, huh? Okay. Sarah. 
Hey, how are you, Dr. Cud? I'm fine. I've got that same exact chair. <sighs> Do you? It's my dining room. Oh, my, <laughs> my daughter does. I knew I'd seen it somewhere. My daughter has that. Same exact chair. Oh, Don't you know, it's a it's a Miss Kelly floor model, so. <sighs> hey, it works. It looked comfortable. It is. And you'll have to forgive me. I might pop off a little earlier. I'm fighting the crud, which has quickly turned into the plague. Oh, goodness. Love us. I'm sorry. <sighs> Brian, were you the one with the flu last week? One of you. Boy, I'm, I'm trying to pin all kinds of things on him. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, I spent two hours in a dentist chair this afternoon, so I'm not tip top myself, but I think I can get through this and hopefully you can understand me. Oh, my mouth still feels a little numb. Um, Dr. Cud. Sir. Sure. The um the uh requirements or the things that we're allowed to have for the final exam are they they're gonna be the same as the midterm was? Exactly. Oh, exactly. Man. I got way more notes this time. I'm trying to figure out how to condense them down. Do they have to be typed? I mean they have to be handwritten. That's what it, it specified. No. no. Okay, specify hand last time, and I had them in an Excel spreadsheet, and he said something about it. I said, "Well, I'm sorry, that's that's all I have. I'm going to use them. You can tell Doctor Cud." Or no, no, no. For your uh, exam aid, it can be. Now, I, I'll tell you what one student tried to do one semester. They tried to take all the slides and reduce <laughs> them down, and all they got out of it was eye strain. They couldn't read. It. <laughs> It made it so small. I don't guess I ought to laugh at that, but it was funny at the time. Well, Dr. Cut, I have the same thing on the midterm exam. I had typed notes and they wouldn't let me use them. Really? No. Oh. Uh, I used mine anyway. I told them I was going to use them and report me. And so I scrambled quickly in 10 minutes prior to the midterm exam to try to transcribe as much as possible by hand to use. I am so sorry. I was not aware of that. Um, let's see, what do we use? Proctor U. And I'll tell them they can be typed or handwritten. You know, I think what I wrote for their directions was simply prepared notes. They said handwritten because I read them right before that. It did say handwritten because I read them when I. Yeah, I'll fix it. Yes, they can be typed. I'll and also, he, he asked about this, but he didn't give me any grief. I had two calculators. Yeah. My BA2 plus I use for the financial stuff, but when it comes to just regular algebraic things, I'm more comfortable using a Texas instrument that I have. What do you um, have? TI what? A TI30XS. Okay. And um, to me, it's just easier to use algebraically. It's got the parentheses and all of it. Anyway, it's, I get around easier on it, so. Allow two calculators, <laughs> typed or handwritten notes. Tell them your tests are so hard, one calculator won't do it, they require two. <laughs> funny. That's funny. Jeff, how you doing this evening? I'm doing well. Feeling much better than last week. You're the one that had the flu. Yes. Oh my gosh. <clears throat> Crystal, good evening. Hi, good evening. I got some great comp I'm embarrassing you in front of the other students. I got some great compliments on you as a student from another prof. You've impressed somebody. She's not responding. I don't know what that means. 
<laughs> oh, sorry. I didn't. Are you talking to me? Yeah. Oh, that's so nice. Sorry, I wasn't you, sure. Actually, I will tell you. It was Doctor uh, Billy and Counting um, Broadhead. Broadhead. Okay. I uh, mm -mm. they can't be. Well, it was you. I may not be getting the prop right, but it was you they were talking about. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm trying to think of uh, his name. I can't right now. And that was in the fall, but that's nice. Yeah. Bailey, how you doing? She disappeared. I spoke and she's poof. I'm eating dinner right now and I figured y'all didn't want to watch me do that. Oh, we don't care. <laughs> if there's one thing we are, it's casual. At least I am. TC. He's there. I'll tell you what, guys, does anybody have seven o'clock? I do. Let's go ahead and start. First of all, we're covering one chapter but it's a long chapter. The author entitles it Capital Structure. He should have entitled it, entitled it Leverage. And he didn't give enough emphasis to what I'm going to call operating leverage. So I've added a good bit on the front end. You'll see. Okay, let's see if we can get rolling here. Wrong set of slides. Give me one second and I'll have them. Unbelievable. I got them. I just need to pull them down. This isn't our sixth meeting, it's our seventh. No wonder I couldn't figure that out. I can't count. Uh, 641, the meeting six. Huh. All right, well, I've got them somewhere. or not, how can this be? All right, guys, give me a second. Oh, this is embarrassing. I've got to slide somewhere. Sixth meeting, fifth, fourth, third, second, first, seventh. Uh, what would I have done with them? Oh, I think I know what I did. Dr. Cut, you could always go to the email that you sent us and pull them from there if you need to. Great idea. That's simple enough. Yeah. Okay. Go to MC. Log in. Don't spank me and make me use that SMS. Okay, good. Noodle. I'll have it in a second, guys. Okay, view history and The meeting and slides. This is going to be funny. I'm not sure. Oh, I know. Here we go. Pulled up an email to myself. Easier.
Sorry, guys. A little technical difficulty. Uh, Your haircut looks nice. <laughs> thanks. Uh, no, Zoom meeting. No, that's not it. It's not Zoom. It's Zoom. All right. Quick mail. How do I? Um, all right, let's do this. I'll send it to myself. I have to send it to one student. So, um, well, Laura, you're up at the top of the list. Just ignore it when you get. I can forward it to you. I've got it up because I just pulled the Zoom meeting up. That might come through fast. Excellent. And I just forwarded it to you too, Dr. Cud. Oh, you did? Okay. Thank you. May get several. <laughs> there it is. Uh, so meeting slides are student version. Open says me. It's taking its sweet time. There we are. Boom. All right. Um, I think I can get rid of all of this, close all of that, and go to downloads, and there it is. No, that's the first Zoom meeting. Oh, man, guys, I'm sorry. I'm, um, all right, well, then we'll go back to that email. Lori, are you sure you sent me tonight's Zoom uh, slides? That's the ones I pulled up to connect to tonight's meeting. Okay. Here we go. Sorry about that, Dr. Cud. I must have just opened an old one for the Zoom meeting. No worries. I just got it pulled up, I think. Open. Running security scan, of course you are. All right. All right. I'll close that one, get that out of the way. Sorry, guys. Um, there we are. What happened? All right, try that again. Share. Um, so why isn't it showing? Sorry, guys. Um, slight technical difficulty here. It's fine. It's just getting a little bit weird. All right, I can pull it up. This way, maybe. Um, capital structure, where are you? All right. 
getting closer. Five that says Zoom meeting capitals of structure. Guys, I need a confirmation. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, this is we're right. good. Leverage. Yep. Okay. Concept of leverage. Leverage is a way to magnify profits and unfortunately losses. To a degree, if you increase your leverage, it's like going to Vegas and increasing the size of the bet. If you win, you win bigger. If you lose, you lose bigger. Now you can increase your leverage by increasing your fixed costs. You basically restructure so that you use more fixed costs and less variable costs. There are two kinds of leverage, operating leverage, which refers to fixed costs in operations, and then financial leverage, which refers to fixed costs in financing. The type of leverage the author does not give enough attention to is called operating leverage. It's the use of fixed costs and operations. How can you increase your operating leverage? If you automate, if you switch to robotics. For simplicity, let's assume we're renting the robot. So that's the increase in our fixed costs. And what it saves, if you're automated, is labor costs. Take this very simple example. Let's say we've got SOAR Corporation, they manufacture drones, consumer drones. They sell them for $150 each. Their variable cost is $100 each. Their fixed costs are $2 million a year, and their forecasted sales are 100,000 drones. So the first question is, What's the expected operating income in the coming year? Operating income is the number of units, that's Q, times price minus variable cost minus fixed cost. You have probably seen this in one of your other courses, but so Operating income, EBIT, would be the number of units, which in this case is 100,000. What happened here? I tell you what, I'm getting all kinds of weird stuff tonight. There. That okay. I really am. I'm getting strange stuff that I haven't seen before. There we go. So we've got a hundred thousand drones. We're going to sell them at a hundred fifty each less the variable cost each, less the fixed cost. So our forecasted level of operating income is 3 million. Now, another question is what is the contribution margin? That is, if we produce and sell one more unit, what have we added to operating profit? And that contribution margin is simply the selling price minus the variable cost. If we produce and sell another unit, we sell it for 150. We incur another 100 in variable costs, so we've added $50 to profit, to operating profit. The, give me while I flip a few pages. The 
the larger the contribution margin, the greater the company's business risk. And business risk refers to volatility in operating income. So if our contribution margin is 50 bucks, if sales go up by one unit, EBIT, operating profit, goes up by $50. If sales go down by one unit, EBIT drops by $50. The bigger the contribution margin, the more variable will be the EBIT, and therefore the greater the business risk. I'll tell you what, you've got your slides. I'm not going to keep bouncing back and forth. What happens to EBIT? If sales increase by 10%, well, for one thing, what would be our revised level of sales? Hundred thousand drones times one plus ten percent would be what? A hundred ten thousand. Are you with me on this so far? Yes, sir. All right. So what would be the percentage change in operating income? If it was, sorry, left out a step. What would be the revised EBIT? If we sell another 10% more drones, 110,000 drones, our EBIT would go up to, I'm getting three and a half mil. Do you increase your forecasted sales? Uh by 10%. I mean, not the, um... So that you increase 2 million by 10% and the 100,000 by 10%? No, no, no. By definition, fixed costs, the- Okay, uh, that's fixed cost, I got you, I'm sorry, okay. That yeah. will vary with the level of sales. That will vary with time. Fixed costs would be things like depreciation, rent, salaries, um, a portion of overhead will be fixed. I got you. And of course your variable costs would primarily be labor and cost of materials and a variable portion of overhead. But if we could pop sales by 10%, the percentage change in ABIT it would go to three and a half from three over a starting base of three, I think it was. Yeah. EBIT would go up not by 10%, but by more, almost 17. And that would be a good thing? To have an increased EBIT? If it fails to go up, you bet. Okay, but that also means that business risk would increase. Is that what you're saying? No, business risk really wouldn't increase. Business risk is dictated by your contribution margin, and that's still 50 bucks a drone. Okay. But the key point, though, is if you can increase sales by 10%, you get an even bigger jump in the EBIT. Now, let's assume, let me go back to the slides and catch up. Let's assume we could redesign the plant 
instead of being heavily labor intensive, it's now capital intensive, it's robotics. We still produce the same quality items, so we'd still sell it for 150. But because we're renting robots, our fixed costs would go up from 2 million to 8 million a year. But the benefit is our variable costs, primarily labor, would drop from 150 to 80. So under this new scenario, I eh, should have written smaller so I could, uh, let's see if we can make this bigger. Nope. Okay, under this new scenario, well, I'm going to try to squeeze it in. Now your expected EBIT, with your original sales level, 100,000 drones, that you sell at 150 each, but with variable costs of 80 and fixed costs of 8 mil, this would push your expected EBIT up to 4 mil. Your contribution margin, I'll squeeze it in over here. Now jumps from 50 to $70 per unit. I did that wrong. Oh my Lord. Hang with me. I messed up my numbers, but not yours. Okay. So what would happen with your business risk if your contribution margin has gone up? Business risk would go up. It'd go up. Before, if you sold another unit, you added 50 to operating profit. Now, you had 70. Dr. Uh, Cut, I'm not, I'm not coming up with 8 million, uh, excuse me, the 4 million there when I... I'm getting... Yeah, me too. Yeah, I messed up, guys. Give me one second. I'm going to go back and make a correction. Uh, I hate it when I do this. And I do it all the time. All right, guys, start over. Real, we'll catch up very quickly. In the original scenario, change one thing for me. Let's change the change the selling price to two hundred. The variable cost to one fifty. This is back on slide four. I'm sorry. So now with this scenario where you've got a labor intensive plant because your variable cost is so high. Now, your um, expected EBIT, if you sell 100,000 drums at 200 each, with a variable cost of 150 and 2 million in a fixed cost. That'd give you 3 mil. That part's right. In EBIT. And your contribution margin, price minus variable cost, would be $50.
And if sales, yeah, what will I use here? If we could increase sales by 10%, There's that thing again. Then the revised level of sales would be 110,000 drums. And percentage change. Ooh. An EBIT, pardon me, the revised EBIT did it again. It'll be a wonder if you guys survive tonight. Sorry about all this. The revised EBIT, if now you can sell 10,000 more drones, would be three and a half mil for a percentage change in EBIT. Again, 16.7%. Now, what if we go to... Dr. Cudd, quick question. The degree of operating leverage, is that what you're about to talk about? Because we have a slide that hits on the degree of operating leverage. Squeeze it in right here. By definition, the degree of operating leverage is a percentage change in EBIT. I'm getting rattled by my mistakes over the percentage change in sales. So in this case, the degree of operating leverage would be 1.67. Why won't this rhyme? There. Thank you. And what exactly does that tell us? It tells us for each 1% increase in sales, we can get a 1.67% increase in operating income. Okay. So the higher this number is, the better. Maybe. Okay. The higher this number is, the greater our incentive to increase sales. Okay. Now, think of this first design as labor intensive. Now we're gonna go look at another plant design. We'd be more efficient at this. And this is, again, I need to change one number. We're selling at 200, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Sorry, guys. With a robotics plant design, we make the same quality drone, so we can still sell it at $200 each. But our variable costs go down because we're saving labor costs. For now, think of renting the robots and that would drive our fixed costs up from 2 million to 8 million a year. So with this robotics plant design, I'm trying to switch colors up here so we don't get, this is what's robotic. Our forecast at EBIT with 100,000 drones would be 
I think that works out to four million. Yes, sir. By the way, before we go any further, based on our forecasts, which plant design should we prefer? Which one gives us more operating income? The upgrade robotics. Yeah, the robotics. Okay. Continue, continuing with this, what would be our new contribution margin? Back in 20. 20, let's see, 200 minus 80, 120, right. So with this plant design, for each additional unit we can produce and sell, we add 120 to operating profit instead of 50. But it's also a double-edged sword. If we lose this sale, we lose 120 in operating profit. Now, working as we did before, in this situation, if sales jump by 10% to, and I think you can handle this math, right? 110,000 drones. What would be our revised EBIT? I know a lot of these numbers are dull and boring, but it helps to make a point that I think you'll see in a minute. Your EBIT would jump to, I'm getting 5.2 million. So the percentage change in the EBIT would be jumping from four to 5.2. That'd be a 30% pop in EBIT instead of 16.7 to jump a 30%. And our degree, and our degree of operating leverage, which is the percentage change in EBIT over the percentage change in sales, degree of operating leverage would increase to three. Notice what happens if you modernize your plant, if you automate your plant, your contribution margin goes up from 50 bucks to 120, which means your business risk goes up as sales go up and down. EBIT will go through wider swings and your degree of operating leverage goes up. Under the manual labor plant, the first plant design for each 1% increase in sales, we got a 1.67% increase in EBIT. With the automated setup, we get nearly twice that. For each 1% increase in sales, we get a 3% jump in EBIT. Or another way to look at it, are we where I can clear this board? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. All right. Sales. Yeah. Effect EBIT. Golly, this thing. The percentage change in sales has an impact 
on the percentage change in EBIT that's magnified by this degree of operating leverage. If sales go up 10% with this robotics design, EBIT would go up 30%. So companies can increase leverage one way, which is operating leverage by going to a more automated setup where you have higher fixed costs, but you do it in exchange for lower variable costs. And when you automate your plant, your contribution margin goes up. So your business risk goes up. EBIT will go through wider swings now. It's a double-edged sword, by the way. I'm trying to find a color I'm not using. If sales go down 10%, EBIT would go down 30%. 30% from what? From our original forecasted point of reference, which was 100,000 drums. So if we're forecasting sales of 100,000 drones with this automated plant, for each 1% increase we get in sales, we get a 3% increase in EBIT. So tell me something. If a company automates its production process, does it have a greater incentive to advertise? Yes. Yeah. The contribution margin is bigger. The payoff is bigger. The jump in EBIT is bigger. So it's not um, a coincidence that when you notice companies upgrade, I think that's what you call it, automate their production process, they also advertise more because the payoff is greater. Not only is there a greater incentive to increase market share, there's a greater incentive to defend market share. Because as I said, this is a double-edged sword. Now, if you lose a sale to a competitor, you're losing, what was it? $120 in operating profit per drone. Even though the um, even though the CM is a lot higher, you would still choose to automate because the EBIT is also a lot higher. I would. Your forecasted EBIT is higher, four million instead of three. But not only that, if you expect sales to grow, under which production scheme would the sales would the EBIT grow at a faster rate? with labor intensive or where it's automated? Automated. Where it's automated. Your contribution margin is bigger. So if sales grow, EBIT will grow at an even faster rate than with the labor intensive plant. You're not old enough to know this, but back in the 70s, the US auto industry greatly automated their production process. And suddenly you couldn't turn on the TV without seeing an auto ad. That's one of the reasons. And no, I won't go there right now. Now there is another concept that's break even, operating break even. Um, Let's do it this way. Um, operating break even is the level of sales you need for operating income to break even. Fixed costs divided by price minus variable costs. 
with the labor intensive plants, your operating break even, what do we have, 2 million in fixed costs? And the contribution margin of 50. So, You'd need to sell 40,000 units, 40,000 drones. What happens to our contribution margin with a robotics plant? Pardon me. What happens to our operating break even with a robot robotics plant design? Increases. It increases. Now we've got to cover 8 million in fixed costs, but we've got a contribution margin of 120. Not a nice round number, but roughly 60, roughly 66, seven drones. What's our forecast of level of drones? Sales in drones. 100,000. 100, so do the, either of these break even points really bother us that much? No. Not really. No. Dr. Cud, you said that the break even is the level of sales needed for? EBIT to break even. EBIT to break even, okay. Yeah, look. Um, do it this way, simpler. By definition, EBIT is the number of units sold times price minus variable cost minus fixed cost. If you set EBIT equal to zero and solve for Q, that's where it comes from. Okay. All right, guys, I am really dropping the ball on this, but that's operating leverage. You increase your operating leverage by moving to where you have more fixed costs and less variable costs by automating. But another kind of leverage is financial leverage. Financial leverage refers to the use of fixed costs in funding. And of course, the primary source of fixed cost funding we think of is debt. Interest expense on debt would be fixed. If you want to increase your financial leverage, just use more debt. Let's assume that this plant is going to cost 18 million bucks. And the initial plan is for it to all come from the owners, all equity, no debt. If that's the case, what would be our expected net income and return on equity? And let's assume a 20% tax rate. Net income is operating income minus interest expense and your author uses r sub d as the interest rate on debt d is the level of debt and with everything else you're having to deal with you're having to deal with my handwriting 
There we go. Maybe. So. And I tell you what, to make things simpler, let's assume that they uh, decided to go, they chose the robotics plant, all right? God. Dr. Cudd, you said that the capital D stands for the level of debt? Capital D, yes. That's what your author uses. Okay. And we'll be given that number? Uh, we'll talk about that. Okay. Why is this thing moving on me? I am scraping little spots on my surface here that's uh, taking over. So our original forecasted level of net income would be based on our forecasted level of operating income, EBFT, with the robotics plant. I think that was four mil, right? And if we go with all equity financing, what do we have an interest expense? If we have no debt, interest expense would be zero. And our net income will be 3.2 mil. All right, and our return on equity. It's just net income over equity. So in this case, we'd be forecasting equity, uh, net income of 3.2 mil on equity of 18 mil, assuming the owners put up everything. And that's 17.8%. Now, What if we can pop sales by 10%? If we have an increase of sales in sales of 10%, that would mean EBIT increases to, what was it earlier? 5.2? 5.2. So now what would be our revised net income? Still where the owners are putting up all the money. No debt, no interest expense. Our net income would increase to 4.16. 4.16 mil. And a percentage change in net income. It would be going from 3.2 to 4.16. That's a percentage jump of sorry, one second. I'm stuck in flipping pages. Thirty percent. Thirty 
And there is a concept called the degree of financial leverage, which is the percentage change in net income for a percentage change in EBIT. Net income would go up by 30%. And if you recall earlier, if EBIT went up from 4 million to 5.2, that also was an increase of 30%. And your degree of financial leverage would be one. Or another way to look at it, EBIT impacts net income. Percentage change in EBIT impacts the percentage change in net income, and it's magnified by the degree of financial leverage. So if EBIT goes up 30%, which is what we had with it going up from 4 to 5.2, Net income would only go up by 30%. There would be no magnification effect because the company doesn't have any debt. They don't have any financial leverage. Now let's assume they're looking at a different capital structure. Instead of funding everything by the owners, they're looking at the owners putting up half the money, half of the 18 million, and borrowing the other half, the other 9 million, at an interest rate of 10%. If they did this, and sales increase, ten percent, which means EBIT with a robotics design increases thirty percent. What would be the revised? Net income We're now looking at EBIT of isn't it five point two mil? I think so. Yeah. This thing is acting crazy on me. Minus interest expense of 10% on how much debt? Nine million. Nine mil. A revised net income would be I'm sorry. Uh, I need to back up. I'm sorry. First, let's look at the case where we don't have the increase in sales. Boy, I'd resign. All right. What if sales? or 100,000 drones, which means EBIT, now this is with robotics, would be, I believe it was four mil, was it not? I believe so. Yeah. So, 
So if they borrow nine million at a 10% interest rate and operating income is four mil, their net income would be, I'm getting 2.48 mil. 2.88. Say again. I'm, I'm making sure my, I get 2.88. I wouldn't doubt it. Four minus 0. 0.9 is that times 0. 0.8. I did something wrong. Hold on, I'm, my bad. I'm sorry. I'm getting 2.48. Yeah, I, I, I did so. I see what I did wrong. Okay. Now, um, and return on equity would be, let's see, we'd be earning 2.48 mil on how much equity? Nine mil, right? The owners put up half. So that'd be 27.6%. But look at what happens if we can increase sales by 10% now. If sales increase 10% to 110,000 drums, if I recall correctly, EBIT would increase to from four million to five point two. Yeah. So now, what is our revised net income? Now we're looking at EBIT of five point two minus the interest expense on debt. Now our net income jumps to, I'm getting 3.44 mil. Now what's our percentage change in net income? It would jump from 2.48 to 3.44. Now I'm getting a 38.7% change in net income. So now our degree of financial leverage, which is the percentage change in net income over the percentage change in EBIT is that a DFL or is that the Delta <laughs> DFL degree of financial leverage And I'm getting 1.29. Our degree of financial leverage is no longer unitary. Since we now have debt, if we increase EBIT, net income will increase by an even greater percentage. Let me show you the net effect. What we have sales effect operating income, which affects net income. The magnification of the percentage in change in sales 
on the percentage change in EBIT, it's magnified by the degree of operating leverage. And the effect that EBIT has on net income is magnified by the degree of financial leverage. So in our particular case, where we've got a robotics plant and we finance half of the cost with debt, if sales increase by 10%, with our degree of financial leverage of three, EBIT would jump 30%, and with our degree of financial leverage, net income would jump by 38.7%. Notice what you have. The impact of sales on net income is magnified by the degree of operating leverage and the degree of financial leverage. You can magnify the effect by modernizing your plant. That will increase your operating leverage. Or you can magnify the effect by using more debt funding. That increases your financial leverage. So what do we do with ROE in all of this? Because some, like a couple times we calculated it, but a couple times we didn't. Yeah. It doesn't appear uh, here. Because it will, it will change the spot the same. Um, it will change by the same degree that net income changes. If sales go up 10%, not only will net income go up 38.7%, but ROE, nah, color, erase. ROE will also go up by 38.7%. It's almost irrelevant. You can just focus on net income. Shareholder profits. Now, there, in your next slides or so, there's another kind of break even. I'm going to skip it for now. I want to show you how this works in a fashion that may make some sense. I know you're sick of the numbers, but the numbers help you to see how this works. Um, Let's talk about the degree of financial and operating leverage Don't worry about this for now. You could say there's something called the degree of total leverage that's a product. And it is a multiplicative type of deal. In our, oh golly. In our particular case, what was that? Oh, okay, pen, yeah. We've got a degree of operating leverage of three, a degree of financial leverage of 1.29, so that total leverage is 3.87. And we could define the degree of total leverage as the percentage change in net income or percentage change in sales. If sales go up 10%, our net income went up 38.7%. It just shows a combined effect. Our 
All right. Now, let's get away from numbers for a minute, and this will be better for you, I think. I'm going to... Is that again a, for each one degree increase in sales that we've got the 3.87% increase? For each 1% increase, in increase in sales. increase in sales, we've got. 3.87% increase in net income. Net income, okay. Guys, that's why when a company's sales change a little bit, the stock goes wild. The magnification effect. Um, all right, look, try to bear with me. Let's take a company like Ford and we're going to characterize it. It's total leverage as a product of operating leverage and financial leverage. Now Ford produces and sales automobiles, consumer durables. I don't know if you remember from economics, but it's the consumer durables component of spending that's so volatile. When we go into recession, people don't put off buying food, they put off replacing their car. So Ford already faces a lot of risk from the uncertainty in its sales because it's selling a consumer durable. Yet you can't make cars without using robotics. You can't make them cost effectively. Now, if you'll notice total leverage is a product of operating leverage and financial leverage. If because Ford already faces so much risk from the uncertainty in its sales, it can't afford to build in a lot more risk. So it wants to keep its total leverage low. And yet, because it's a manufacturer, and has to invest in a lot of equipment that has high fixed cost. By the nature of the industry, its operating leverage has to be high. So what does that leave for financial leverage? And you need to think of this as a plug figure. For this to work out, for its total leverage to be low, see leverage is a source of risk. Uncertainty in sales is a source of risk. Ford already has too much risk from the uncertainty in sales to build in a lot of leverage. So it wants to keep its leverage low, yet it's forced by the nature of the industry to have high operating leverage. So what does that mean in terms of financial leverage? It's got to be really, really low. If you look around from one industry to the next, you'll find debt ratios among auto producers are among the lowest of any industry. 10 to 15% based on market value is pretty common. Now, if you wanted to see this in terms of a graph, Here's your debt ratio, debt over value. As a company increases its use of debt, it gets riskier, right? So its cost of debt goes up. Lenders faced with a company with more debt look at it as being riskier. So they charge a higher interest rate. And just as it's riskier for the creditors, it's also riskier for the stockholders. The stockholders required rate of return goes up. Now the cost of capital 
is a weighted average of the cost of debt and the cost of equity. Initially, the cost of capital will go down because debt's cheaper than equity. But you can push a good thing too far as a company continues to try to increase its use of debt, the cost of capital will turn back up because both the component cost of debt and the component cost of equity go up. Where do corporations want to be on that WAC schedule? They want to minimize the cost of capital because that'll maximize the value of their, their stock. The lower the cost of capital, the lower the required rate of return you need to earn on a project to add to the value of the company, the easier it is to find projects that exceed the whack and add to the value of the company. The key point, though, is where does this thing bottom out for Ford? At a very low level of debt. They're already so risky because they make and sell automobiles that as soon as they start to increase their debt ratio even a little bit, both the creditors and the stockholders get nervous. They push up their required rate of return. And that makes the cost of capital, that is the mix of debt and equity that maximizes the share price, that makes the cost of capital bottom out at a very low level of debt. Let me say it one more time and we'll move to another company. Ford is already risky because it sells automobiles, consumer durables, and durable spending goes through wide swings when we go from a growth economy to a recession. Because Ford already faces so much risk in its sales, it can't afford to build in a lot of additional risk in leverage. So that's why it's debt ratios at a very low level. Let's take another company, a retailer, in fact, a clothing retailer like Gap. Let's go through the same process. How volatile are clothing sales compared to auto sales? which is a lot more stable. Clothing sales. So Gap doesn't face as much risk from the uncertainty in sales because its sales aren't as uncertain. They don't go through wide swings like auto sales do. Because Gap does not face as much risk from uncertainty in sales as Ford, Gap can afford to build in a high level of leverage. And yet Gap is a retailer. It doesn't manufacture clothing, it simply buys it and sells it. So it doesn't have much in the way of fixed costs. Its fixed costs are like rent for spaces in the mall, um, It'll rent some of the cash registers, stuff like that, counters. But its fixed costs are very low compared to somebody like Ford. So, if GAP wants its total leverage to be high and it's operating leverage by the nature of the industry, the fact that they're a clothing retailer is low, 
what does that mean their financial leverage can be? Through the roof. I don't know if you've looked at the debt ratios of clothing retailers, they're up around 70 plus percent. They're about as high as any industry, unless you look at banks. They have a very high financial leverage, very high debt ratio. This is why. They go through the same process as Ford. As they start to use more debt, their cost of debt will eventually turn up and the stockholders, because of the increased risk, will eventually get nervous and require a higher return. But this doesn't happen until GAP hits a really high debt ratio. <coughs> it's at a, half, a very high debt ratio that their cost of capital is minimized and the stock price is maximized. One more company. Electric utilities like Entergy. Only let's go around this, go about this backwards. Does Entergy have much debt? Have you looked at the debt ratios for electric utilities? No, sir. They are really high. 60, 70 plus percent. And yet they manufacture electricity. Do they have much in the way of heavy equipment, fixed costs? Yes. Tons. Well, that would produce their total leverage effect would be through the roof. Since they've got both high operating leverage and high financial leverage. How do they get away with that? Have you ever looked at the sales chart for an electric utility like energy? It almost looks like a straight line. Their sales are extremely stable. Is that because they're allowed to be a monopoly? Part of it's that, but most of it is they're what? A large component of energy sales will be electricity to residential people like you and me. And we really don't vary how much electricity we use that much from one year to the next. And also how many customers, household customers does energy have? Tens of hundreds of thousands, right? So they've also got a great diversification in those sales. That's why their sales are so stable. Now, if you go up to the Northeast, there are some electric utility companies that have a high portion of their sales that go to, industri to the industrial sector. So they'll be, their sales will be more volatile. They'll carry less total leverage as a result of that. Are you guys with me on this so far? It's a lot to absorb. I think the, and this is probably a dumb question, but I think the hardest thing for me to wrap my head around is this idea that like that debt and leverage is a good thing for companies. Because when I think about it in terms of a personal sense, I mean, we, we want to avoid personal debt. Yeah. Here's That's a bad thing. Here's the problem. Companies want to maximize their profits. And the cost of debt is tax deductible. Companies that don't use debt are idiots. It's an easy way to magnify profits. If, if you've got a company, this is straightforward enough, I think. Hello. 
Let's say you've got a company and they can borrow, oh, I don't know, at a 6% rate and they're in a, oh, I don't know, let's say 30% tax bracket, then their after-tax cost of debt is 4.2%. I have no idea why it's doing this. 4.2%, meaning all they have to do to cover the cost of debt is earn more than 4.2% after taxes. Or let's go back to the one of our earlier examples. Here's your electric utility. All right. What if they decided we want to play it safe, have no debt? Um, this is a bad graph. Give me a second. Let me back up a couple. Yeah. I've got something in the way with everyone. Here we go. All right. Ford. What if Ford decided we don't want to fiddle with debt? So they carried no debt. What would that do to the value of their stock compared to what they could make the value of that stock? You know, a manager can get fired by taking on too much risk, but a manager can also get fired by not taking on enough. What is our goal in terms of the price of the stock? We want to maximize it. You don't do that by carrying zero debt. As long as you can earn more on the borrowed funds and you're having to pay an interest on them, you come out ahead, you add to shareholder wealth. I do understand your point. You have a very good point, but the catch is in industry, managers are charged with trying to maximize the value of the stock and you don't do that with zero debt. Okay, that helps. It is very counterintuitive. Yeah. In, I guess, personal experience. But the interesting thing is how much debt maximizes the shareholder wealth depends on the industry. Ford, because it already faces so much risk from the uncertainty in auto sales, it can't afford to carry much debt. So the level of debt that maximizes the value of the stock is really low. Yet for a company like Gap, the level of debt that maximizes the value of the stock is very high. Gap does not have much risk from uncertainty in sales, nothing like Ford. So we can afford to build in a lot of leverage. In fact, if it doesn't, it's not maximizing the value of the stock. Anyway. No, that's, that's helpful because, you know, obviously no debt is not going to ma maximize shareholder profits, but too much debt makes the company at risk of bankruptcy and not a stable company. Correct. Guys, I got to slide 36. I got through the part that the author doesn't cover well. 
everything that's left in the slides I was going to cover tonight is pretty easy to follow. Well, not easy, but it's covered well by the book. And of course, you do have the lecture slides and the voiceover PowerPoint YouTube videos. We have gone about an hour and a half, and to be quite honest with you, <laughs> face to face, I sat in the dentist chair for two hours late this afternoon. My mouth is killing me. Would it be okay if we adjourn at this point? Like anybody's going to say no, but. Uh, could you, is there anything about our case for this week that would be helpful to know? Your case largely deals, well, it actually deals with both parts, both kinds of leverage, operating and financial. And we got up to the point, you know, we covered operating and financial leverage from an accounting sense. We looked at the effect of sales on operating income and net income. What I was about to start to cover, which starts with slide 37 in tonight's slides, is how basically just debt leverage affects the value of the company and the value of the stock. So, with slide 37, we shift from an accounting emphasis to a market value emphasis. And I don't have it in me to go through this, guys. You've got six and six and three. 15 slides left. Why don't you take a look at the slides that I sent to you for tonight and that one of you sent back to me. Lori, I think that was you. Thank you. Or was it Crystal? I forget. Caitlin, maybe you. One of them. Thank you to somebody. I think it was Lori. You're welcome. <laughs> and if you have questions, send them to me. Oh, you know, I'll have questions, Dr. Cud. <laughs> oh, same for me. Always, always do. <laughs> I count on it. Look, I, uh, I know most professors want students that just pepper them with questions. We appreciate it when you're working hard, and that's the best evidence. And I'll get that from a bunch of you. And of course, a little of it shows up on your test scores too. That doesn't hurt. All right. TC, are you out there? I'm here. Cool. Briante, I think you're the only two I didn't say hello to tonight. C, 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 uh, C. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Guys. I'm going to call it quits. We've done pretty well. We went an hour and a half anyway, and I covered the part that I really don't think the author covers so well. We made up for it last week. What did you? <laughs> we had we had more than two hours last week, didn't we? These Zoom meetings to be really short and uh, like a warm up. And it turned into a monster last week because it was so much material. All right, guys, you have a good evening. All right. Well, oh, one, thanks, one, you one too. One more thing. One more thing. Did you notice that I've moved your final exam instead of Saturday, Sunday? It's Friday, Saturday. Yes. yes. I have to do that to get them graded Sunday and get grades in because the new term classes start that Monday. Can you have Saturday format? 
two day window that's Friday and Saturday for your final? It's a rhetorical question. <laughs> okay, guys, you have a good evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks, you, you too. too. Thank you. Good night.